Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and, and Revelation 11. Oh. oh, by the way, I yesterday went through Isaiah 40 and I was so tired and not feeling myself really last night. I, uh, I just didn't do it justice. And I was studying it this morning and going over Isaiah 40. It just makes me want to do the whole thing again, but I can't because we're doing Isaiah 41. But uh, let me encourage you to go back and, and study Isaiah 40. It is so awesome. There are there's there are comforts. Comfort, comfort my people, says God. And then there's a whole load of comforts that God gives to his people. I won't go over it now. Let me just say, um, I wish I could. Maybe I'll do another special family Bible time (laughs) just on Isaiah 40. But for today, Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for teaching us. Um, Thank you, Lord, for the, the time we get to study your word and to learn from you we pray that you would open our eyes now please help us to understand your word please give us um, comfort that we need through your word please teach us and prepare us and equip us Uh, we pray that you would prepare us for whatever tasks you have for us to do that you would strengthen us to be ready to serve you, we pray. Please help us to keep these things in our minds. We realize that we're so prone to just let it all go and to lose it quickly. We pray that you would um, you would build us up for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. All right, Isaiah 41. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Now, where have you just seen that? Okay, you've just seen that phrase at the end of chapter 40, haven't you? Those who wait upon the Lord, they who wait for the Lord, shall renew their strength. Now he's saying, let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, verse 1, continuing. Let them approach, Let then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? Uh, now, who's this talking about? Um, this MacArthur Study Bible, very helpful, relates this to Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. And that's what set me back studying chapter 40 in more detail because I realized I had not got, I couldn't figure it out who this one was. And and when I read that MacArthur says it's Cyrus, I thought, well, I am missing a trick here and sent me back into chapter 40. And then I spent the whole, <laughs> the whole of my Bible time this morning studying Isaiah 40 and realizing that I'd missed so much. Um, but here's the deal. In, 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 at the end of chapter 39, well, in chapter 39, you've got the envoys from Babylon. And then the prophecy at the end of chapter 39 saying to Hezekiah, some of your sons are going to go and be eunuchs in the house of the king of Babylon. So, so this is getting to the point in the prophecy of Isaiah where he's predicting the, the, the exile into Babylon from Nebuchadnezzar. But then in chapter 40, it's talking about comfort, comfort. And this is very interesting because, again, the MacArthur Study Bible says that chapter 40 looks at the hope and comfort of a blessed future subsequent to God's judgment and captivity in Babylon. Now that's interesting. So after Babylon, this is the comfort for God's 
people in chapter 40. And I'd missed that transition in my mind. So in chapter 41, here we are and we're looking at this and we're saying, who stirred up one from the east? And I'm thinking, well, who is that one from the east? Um, it's always good to go back and check <laughs> check your own work. Now, where else have we heard that? I don't know. It's a good lesson to learn, isn't it? Um, right, verse 2. Who stirred up one from the east, whom, whom victory meets at every step? That was the progress of King Cyrus. He gave, gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. <laughs> That's another one that proves Jesus is God, because in Revelation chapter 1, mm -hmm. verses 7 to 8, well, we've got the same thing referred to, haven't we? So let's just read it. Revelation chapter 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. Verse uh, 18. And then in verse 18, we've got Jesus saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one, verse 18, that was the end of verse 17, fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, hold on, back to Isaiah, mm -hmm. chapter 41, and verse uh, 4, I, Yahweh, the first, and with the last, I am he. Mm. So this is the same deal. This mm -hmm. is God, the Lord, Yahweh, saying, I'm the first and I'm the last. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus says the same thing about himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 5. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, Be strong. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer, he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes the anvil, in other words, the one who smooths with the hammer, encourages and strengthens the one who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, It's good. And they strengthen it with the nails so that it cannot be moved. What's the picture here? The craftsman making idols. They're constructing idols. They're saying, come on, it's all right, come on. Everyone's encouraging one another. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. James quotes this, doesn't he? James mm -hmm. 2, 23, I think. He quotes it. Abraham became called the friend of God. Offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Okay, first of all, that is the kind of text that people take mm. out of context and put on the wall. We've actually got one of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we? Mm. I think we bought it in Papua New Guinea, didn't we? Yes. And it was written on a piece of tree bark. And it's very beautiful, and I like it. Do we still have it on the I wall? Think it died. Did it die? Mm. Did it go mouldy? It just died. Okay. It moved and scrunched. Moved and times. scrunched. Okay. So we had one, mm -hmm. and I liked it. 
because it reminded me of the promises of God. But by the way, just in case you're tempted to do this, be careful. Who's the you? Mm. Who's the you? When... Real nice, huh? Right, so fear not, verse 10, for I am with you. Who's you? Well, go back to verse 9. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Who's the you? Go back to verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. All right. Who was it written to? It was written to Israel. National Israel, the people of God Israel, the chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, the friend of God. Okay, get it? So you can't just take that and personalize it and think God is speaking directly to you. What's the context? We can learn from it. The context is, okay, God is dealing with the nations. God is dealing with Cyrus, the Persian king, king of Media and Persia. God is bringing about the restoration of his people from captivity. Now, right now, when Isaiah is writing, they haven't even gone into captivity. And this is what's so exciting about chapter 40 and the comfort, comfort my people. That I, met, I don't know how much I missed yesterday, but <laughs> I missed so much it was painful today. But um, this is what's so exciting about it. Why? Because God is about to send his people into captivity... But he's already comforting his people in the light of their coming captivity. He's comforting them about his future plans. He's saying, look, who is it? Who is it who's raising up Cyrus? Who is it who's giving victory to this king from the east? It's me. I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm in charge of things around here, says God, and I'm not making a mistake. Oh, people of Israel, you who are going to be going into captivity and suffering in captivity because of your sin, mm. fear not. You faithful ones who fear me, fear not. Why not? Why? For I am with you. Think about Daniel. I think about Daniel. Traipsing off as a slave as a captive to Babylon. Mm. Do you think he had these words? Mm. Do you think he treasured these words? I think he treasured these words. We know he read Jeremiah. I'm presuming he read Isaiah as well. Mm. How think he treasured these words? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Can you imagine Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's court? being told, come on, eat the food the king has given you, and saying, I'm not going to defile myself. What? Don't you fear the king? The servant of Nebuchadnezzar is saying to him, I'm afraid of the king. If, you, if I don't feed you properly, I'm, <laughs> my life's forfeit. Daniel's saying, I'm not eating it. I mean, what could motivate someone to do like that? Oh, this is the comfort that Daniel had, perhaps. Maybe from this word, this verse, or some... Maybe he had it written on his wall. <laughs> that would have been appropriate. <laughs> For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. Think of Think of Daniel, think of the captives looking at words like this and thinking, you know what, these Babylonians, I feel sorry for them. I know we're the captives. We're the captives, but they're the ones who are in trouble. Because if we're faithful to God, he's going to restore us. He's going to care for us now. He's going to restore us eventually. We're going to be all right. But those poor Babylonians serving Nisroch and um, Bell and all these Babylonian gods these these poor Babylonians are going to perish but we're going to be preserved all those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish think of 
Think of Daniel looking at Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar who made the great golden image and you know mm. and and thinking he's gonna be as nothing and perish. Maybe this is what gave Daniel the courage to speak to Nebuchadnezzar as he did. Anyway. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Now, how, how does that help us? Well, okay. We can feel intimidated. <coughs> and we can feel as though we're nobodies, we're nothing, we're the captives. We're just pilgrims in this world. That's how Peter wrote to the Christians, to the exiles, strangers. We're just passing through. We've got no... Here we have no lasting city. Mm. But, but those who war against us are going to be brought to nothing. God is going to stroke, they're going to perish. But we have an inheritance kept in heaven for us that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Praise God. So do you feel small? Do you feel like a little worm sometimes? All right, verse 14. <laughs> Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. You shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them and carry the wind, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord. In the Holy One of Israel you shall glory. Now, again, think of those promises in the context of coming captivity. When the poor and the needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may, and may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Set forth your case, says the Lord. Bring your proofs, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring them and tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them, that we may know their outcome, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter, <laughs> that we may know that you are gods. Do harm, or do good, or do harm, that we may be dismayed and terrified. Behold, you are nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. Now imagine being carted off as a captive into Babylon and seeing all the impressive temples mm -hmm. and the idols mm -hmm. and having these words ringing in your ears. I stirred up one from the north and he has come from the rising of the sun and he shall call upon my name. Hmm. Is this speaking about Nebuchadnezzar, the one from the north? I think does usually speak about Nebuchadnezzar. I should have checked the MacArthur Study Bible notes on this. Maybe someone can post in the comments what he says. I didn't read it. But um, I stood up one from the north, and he has come from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name. Um, he shall trample on rulers as on mortar. Maybe it's still speaking about Cyrus, we'll see. As the potter treads clay, who declared it from the beginning that we might know and beforehand that we might say he's right? 
There was none who declared it, none who proclaimed, none who heard your words. I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are. And I give Jerusalem, I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news. But when I look, there is no one among these, there is no counsellor. Who then, who, when I ask, gives an answer? Behold, they're all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. <laughs> empty wind. Oh. This is so good, isn't mm -hmm. it? Okay, what's the picture here? So the picture here is God, the Lord, then kind of throwing down a challenge to the idols and to the idol worshippers and saying, come on and set forth your case. Bring, bring your proofs. Go on, tell us something. Tell us something. Tell us what's going to happen in the future, if you can, really. And tell, do some good or, or do harm even mm -hmm. that we, we could be dismayed or terrified behold you're nothing that's a challenge mm. it's like Elijah on Mount Carmel isn't it saying come on call him louder <laughs> call him louder surely he is a god maybe he's on the toilet mm -hmm. maybe he's maybe he's sleeping see if you can wake him up this is God's version of Elijah's speech. Yeah. All right, that's Isaiah 41. God's sarcasm. God's, oh, very good. Yes, yeah, sarcasm in the Bible. We like sarcasm. It's biblical. <laughs> it's not the lowest form of wit. Otherwise, God wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> verse 1, chapter 11. Where are we? We're in Revelation. No, we're in the kitchen. Very funny. Um, <laughs> Revelation chapter 11. This is more <laughs> remarkable vision stuff. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. Who, who else was told to... And I was told, rise and measure the oh, temple. Ezekiel. Yes, Ezekiel. It was Ezekiel, wasn't it? Mm. Now, when it says the temple, he's talking about the Holy of Holies because, look, he, he says, do not measure the court outside the temple in verse 2. But let, let me finish verse 1. I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it's given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Okay, stop there for a moment. Measuring the temple... Not measuring the court. What's all that about? Okay, measuring <coughs> is thought to be a sign of kind of ownership. So I guess a bit like when you take ownership of something or you possess something, you, you measure it. But if you're not owning it, if you're not, if you're not respecting it, if you're not interested in it, if you're rejecting something, you would say, no, no, don't measure that. I'm not, I'm not having that. Well, um, that's the picture here. God is saying, that temple, that's mine, measure it. Which temple, by the way? No, well, the temple, not in AD 70, mm. it was knocked down and um, burned by the Romans. And this, this book of Revelation wasn't written until later. And since then, the temple hasn't been rebuilt. That was the second temple. In a, that was built on the return from exile in Babylon and then rebuilt and rebuilt, but never knocked down. It was just kind of remodeled and Herod remodeled it and um, refurbished it and enlarged it. So that was still considered the second temple until AD 70 and that was destroyed. So which temple is this? Well, this is the temple that's going to exist in the last days. And you say, well, is there going to be a temple in the last days? Well, there has to be a temple because in 2 Thessalonians 2, it talks about the man of lawlessness who's going to take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. He's the chap we consider to be the Antichrist. That's John's language, but it applies to that. And we're going to use it here as well. 
But the man of lawlessness, this figure, yes. Do you know where the temple is going to be? Oh, I do. Yes, it's going to be in Jerusalem. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> well, on the Temple Mount, actually, very interestingly, some people think that the temple, the current site of the Dome of the Rock, that, that, that Islamic golden domed building that sits on the Temple Mount, is not actually on the side of the temple. Because some people say, well, when the descriptions of the temple, or well, people have seen that the descriptions of the location of the temple in from many years ago, from before it was destroyed, was it was two thirds of the way to the north on the Temple Mount area. And so it would have been more, it would have been just north of the Dome of the Rock. So some people say, oh, the Jews are going to have to destroy the Dome of the Rock in order to rebuild the temple. And other people say, no, no, the actual site of the temple was just north, and they're going to rebuild the temple alongside the Dome of the Rock. Well, whatever, we'll know. We'll get there when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we won't get there. Um, yes, but there, there's going to be a temple. So the Jews have actually got it all ready. They've got all the materials ready. They've got the plans. They've got everything ready to go. They've got the cows as well. They've now got the red heifers in place, yes. Yeah, so... They're kind of preparing themselves for this. But um, certainly in order to fulfill the prophecies about what's going to happen in the future, the temple has to be rebuilt. So I'm going to say it's that temple. This is what we consider the tribulation temple um, because it's going to be existing during the tribulation time. Okay. So... And it's interesting, he says, don't measure the the outer court because that's given over to the nations. Does that mean that the the it, there's going to be the presence still in the outer court of the Al-Aqsa Mosque? I don't know. <coughs> in the Dome of the Rock. I don't know. But it's given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, that is speaking about well, how, how long is 42 months divided by 12? That's three and a half years. Okay. That speaks about, um, well, at least those of us who are looking for, trying to add it all up and work it all out as to which part of the tribulation period is which, that speaks about most likely the second half of the seven-year period of the tribulation. If you're in Daniel chapter... Um, nine, and you're wondering about Daniel's seventieth week, and um, you're trying to piece all that together with the other prophecies that relate to this. You say, "Oh, this is probably the second half of the tribulation period," and that's when that's when the 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 Antichrist is going to be revealed. He'll make a covenant with the Jews for the first half, and then he'll break the covenant halfway through the seven-year tribulation period. And in the second half, the three and a half years that finish up the seven-year tribulation period, the Antichrist is just going to, his, you would say the mask is off, mm. and he's going to turn on the Jews, and it's going to be a terrible time of persecution of the Jews. Verse 3 God has kind of a remarkable, um, you would say, uh, s remarkably stubborn, annoying thorn in the side of the Antichrist at this point. Verse 3, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for... 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, what's 1,260 days divided by 30? It's 42. And that's 1,260 days divided by 30, 42 months, average month being 30 days, according to the Jewish calendar. And so 30 day months, 42 months, how many years is that? Three and a half years. So for three and a half years, they're going to prophesy clothed in sackcloth. And now who are they? 
Glad you asked. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees. Well, that helps, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, we're going to come to Zechariah chapter 4 eventually as we go on through the year. But in Zechariah 4, that's where that imagery comes from. And I'm just going to leave it till then because I don't know how I can do all of this with that much time otherwise. But that's where the imagery comes from. So there are these two figures. And we get some insight into it in Zechariah 4. We'll get there when we get there. But verse 5, And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of pours from their mouth and consumes their foes if anyone would harm them this is how he is doomed to be killed in other words by fire coming out of their mouth now verse 6 they have power the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying now who did that in in the bible elijah, elijah. All right how long did he do it for Three and a half years, yeah. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now, who did that in the Bible? Come on. Moses. Moses. All right. You have to speak up quick because she's good with the Bible, that woman. She's been studying it for years. Um, Moses, right? I see that face. <laughs> so who are these two witnesses? And the answer is, we don't oh, know. we don't know. <laughs> you say, Tom, it must be Moses and Elijah. Well, I think you might be right, but it doesn't say. <clears throat> and Elijah is supposed to come for Jesus. Very good, yes. But wasn't Elijah John the Baptist? Very good. And so John the Baptist was Elijah, if you could receive it, says Jesus. He was in the spirit and power of Elijah. But Elijah has to come, according to Malachi, before the Lord returns. Mm -hmm. And so there's actually going to be an Elijah. And is this it? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Oh, no. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Where's that? Jerusalem. So we're talking about Jerusalem. They're going to be prophesying. They're going to be killed in Jerusalem. Now the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. Oh, well, we read about that in chapter 9, verse 21. No, verse... <coughs> Chapter 9, verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek he is called Apollyon. Mm. Oh, interesting, the angel. So is it that beast that rises from the bottomless pit? Or is it talking about the beasts of chapter 13? We'll get there when we get there which is the Antichrist. And he said, well, the beast, that beast comes out of the sea. Um, oh, well, um, which one is it? Well, I'll leave you to debate that with yourself. But the beast who rises from the bottomless pit is going to kill them. Either it's Satan empowering the Antichrist, or it's Satan, or it's the Antichrist, or... Anyway, it's them. Um... <laughs> They're going to get killed. He's going to make war on them and kill them. And their dead bodies are going to lie in the street. Yes. So is the Antichrist going to be a Jew? You ask the best questions. But look, we're out of sound. We'll get there when we get there. For three and a half days, verse 9... Some of the peoples and tribes and languages will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. It's interesting, isn't it? People preaching 
about God mm. can be a torment to people who want to live like there is no God. Mm -hmm. Just remember that. Verse 11. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. Now stop there for a second. This is just unbelievable, isn't it? This is like the, the people, the two people on earth at that point who are prophesying. Notice that they're prophesying. So the gift of prophecy is not completely dead. Uh, it's, I would say, not active at the moment, but it, according to 1 Corinthians 13, um, as best I understand it, tongues cease, ceases by itself as the New Testament age comes to an end, uh, as the apostolic age comes to an end, rather, and the, the time for the necessity of tongues as a sign comes to an end. But tongues, but, but, but prophecy, sorry, shall be abolished. It should be done away with. That's going to be abolished when the Lord returns. So prophecy is in abeyance, but not abolished. Prophecy has temporarily ceased, but it's not done with because there are going to be two prophets in the future who are going to prophesy and they will be giving revelation Maybe they're going to explain. Someone asked, what, what were the seven thunders? And I said, well, we're not told what the seven thunders said. And I'm not sure what the seven thunders were, but it was the voice in the previous chapter. And um, maybe these prophets will explain what the seven thunders said. I don't know. Um, but they're going to get killed, and then they're going to come alive, and then they're going to go up to heaven, and everyone's going to be like, ah, and then there's an earthquake, and 7,000 people in the city die. Mm. What happens to the rest? Look at verse 13, the last part of verse 13. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Hold on a minute, the plagues are coming and everyone's refusing to repent, right? But now, in Jerusalem... The prophets go up into heaven. Finally, at this point, the Jews repent. <laughs> I've got in here salvation in Jerusalem in my <laughs> margin. This is this is this is what the world has been waiting for. <laughs> and with that, verse 14, the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is in anticipation of the coming of Christ. Where this is like the cry as the tide of the battle is turning and the cry goes up, Victory, victory. We're, we're going to, we're winning. We're, we, we, the end is coming. We've won. You could say we've won when you get to you know, 5 nil in a football game and there's only 10 minutes left, you know, you just, um, yeah, but this is, that's still uncertain, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. all sorts of weird things can happen mm -hmm. in football games. But this is no football game and this is no vain cry. This mm -hmm. is the cry of the coming victory. Verse 16, and the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged. Think about Psalm 2. But your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and, the, and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great. For and for the destroying and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Hooray. Mm. Verse it doesn't say hooray, but that's just <laughs> verse nineteen. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, 
and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Well, God knows how to do drama far better than the kings and queens of this world. Lord, we pray, come quickly. Come and rule and reign. Lord, come and bring about your great and terrifying end. It is sweet to our taste, but we realise it's bitter to our stomachs. Lord, these things are terrible and fearful. We know that the people of this world, our friends, our neighbours, our family members, just don't know what's coming. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon them. Open their eyes that they may turn to you and repent, we pray in Jesus' name. Help us who love you to know that no matter what you take us through, we can trust you. Amen. Amen. All right, sorry, I went over a bit today. I don't think you can notice it going, but we'll say God bless you and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. Mm-hmm.